Well, good evening from me. Uh, my name is Paul. It's so good to see you here tonight at the Mklanga PM service. I just want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. It's great to have you with us. This morning, we had someone watching online from Brunei. And I just think that's incredible that we have this ability to reach people all over the world. So welcome to those of you who join us online. We've got a great service lined up for you over the next 60 minutes, but we're going to start the service uh, by singing together. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing along with the band during this time now.
as honestly as I know how. Broken by the days gone by, Spirit help my soul to
as we sing the words of the song, it is well, it is well with my soul. It doesn't necessarily mean things are going perfectly. Maybe tonight you're in the midst of suffering and pain or in the midst of doubt and confusion. But in these circumstances, we can sing, it is well with my soul because God is sovereign and in control. And so tonight we invite you to declare these words. Well, it is well. 
thank you that we can declare these words, it is well, in spite of our circumstances, because you are a God who is faithful and in control. So we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you take your seats and have a look at the screens? Hi, everybody. I have an exciting announcement to share with you today. As you know, at the beginning of 2018, we decided that this year will be a year of disruption. And one of the ways in which we caused this disruption was to cancel all our conferences except the counseling conference. And the reason why we want to disrupt this year was to find something uniquely better. And I think we found some of the things. I don't think we found everything yet. We wanted to change the way we do our Sunday services and the creative process that leads us to that. We wanted to create more warmth in the auditorium here in Mschlange and we changed the seating into sections. We also launched Group Life and we've invested into groups like we've never done before. In Belito, we started a second service and we began to speak about succession and the redeploying of some of our people. All these changes are really, really exciting. Now for me, when we came to the whole aspect of the Global Leadership Summit and canceling their conference, it really was one of the toughest decisions that I was a part of. The reason being is that we were one of the very first churches when the Global Leadership Summit went global to host the conference. And over the last 13 years or so, we've held the conference every single year and we have run one of the best conferences in the world according to all the stats that have come back from the conference. So the other day, I come down to our coffee shop and I see Jerry Couchman. He's the director of the Willow Creek Association here in South Africa. And he's looking really glum. He's on his way to the airport and he's killing some time in our coffee shop. So I say, hey, Jerry, why are you looking so down? He says, the conference that was to be held in the Mems and Toti, the guys there have called it off. They've canceled the conference just a couple of weeks before their due date. They had 250 registered delegates to the conference and they've pulled out of the conference. And so naturally, he was really, really disappointed. The following day, I got together with our team. And as we discussed this, we decided, hey, let's step it up with a couple of weeks to go. Let us be the ones that step it up and host the conference once again. And so we began to get really excited. We shared with some of our staff. They got really excited. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to run a one-day event on Friday, the 2nd of November. Only one day, not two days. We're going to do a little less the production elements. We're going to start a little earlier, finish a little later. And of the 10 talks, we're definitely going to get eight of the best talks. And here's the magnificent thing about this adventure, is that this conference is one of the best conferences that have ever been done at the Global Leadership Summit, in spite of some of the difficulties that Willow Creek have faced over the course of this year. So I want to invite you to be part of this conference. The price is reduced, there's going to be a lunch be served, and we're going to bring a world-class conference back to our own Mschlange campus. So I hope you sign up and be part of this thing. 2nd of November, hope to see you there. So that's the GLS. Uh, one of the things I love about our church is that... Uh, that we're a church of grace, and we're going to try some stuff, but man, when, when there is a need, we're going to step into that need, and, and I love the way that we've stepped in to, to support an organization that's meant so much to us over the years. The GLS is just phenomenal. If you haven't been to one, if you haven't already bought a ticket, I really want to encourage you, go onto the, the, the Willow Creek website uh, to, to register there, to buy your tickets there. They are, are reduced. We're not selling tickets here. If you phone Grace, we're going to redirect you to the website. So just go to the website, and that's a great place to start. I'm going to just introduce myself again. Uh, if we haven't, <laughs> excuse me, if we haven't met before, my name is Paul. I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I get emotional sometimes, you know. Um, if we haven't met before, my name's Paul, and uh, I'm part of the Group Life team here at Grace. Again, I just want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. It is so great to have you with us. We're going to go into the part of our service where we uh, take an opportunity to give of our tithes and our offerings. If you're joining us online, I want to encourage you. You'll see a little tagline on the bottom of your screens now. Now, I don't know if the timing was good on that, but hopefully it was, uh, and you can give through that, uh, that code on there. If you give during this part of the service, you can go ahead and prepare for that now. But I just want to say, if, if you call Grace home, I mean, if this is a place that you come to regularly, you feel like this is your church, your place where you belong, I want to encourage you to engage in what we call uh, percentage priority giving. That's where you pick a percentage, you prioritize giving it at the beginning of the month, and you give it. And one of the ways that you can do that, this is an amazing thing that's, that's happening in our world, is through technology. Maybe it's your online banking profile or however you want to use that. And this is why I, I want to encourage you to do that. 
Because what we prioritize, we pursue. What we prioritize, we pursue. And when we say, God, we're going to prioritize giving to you, we're going to prioritize that, that we're going to say we trust you with our finances, we begin to pursue that reality in our hearts. And not only because God is, so the beautiful thing is because God is faithful, when we pursue those realities, those, those truths become entrenched in our hearts. And so I want to encourage you, prioritize that God is your source. Prioritize that God is, is, the, is the very sense of your life, that you're trusting him with all that you have, because what you prioritize, you begin to pursue. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you are the source of all that we have and all that we are. Uh, help us in everything that we do to prioritize you. And now with our finances, God, let us prioritize you in this, in this space and in this time. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, team. You can pass the baskets around as we continue the service. And then just to let you know, if you are a parent of a grade six child, human being that's in grade six, uh, usually at this time of the year, you start to begin to worry, uh, wonder what's happening next, uh, what's happening next year. And I, I just want to say here at Grace Family Church, we so pursue valuing, so we, we so value the next generation, and we want to actively create environments that are relevant and appropriate to that generation and meet them with content that's, that's appro appropriate and, and approachable. And so there's so many different ways that we do that, but just to let you know what's coming up next, if you come to this service starting next week, uh, the Grade sixes, along with uh, Lauren and some of our youth leaders who sit all amongst this area, are going to start attending this service. But also, starting next week, we have our transit groups happening at the 915 service. And so if you do have a grade six child, I really want to encourage you to bring them along to, to this service for, for a while so that they can connect relationally with some of the youth leaders and, and it helps them transition into next year as they start to attend youth next year. So that's transit group starting next week and grade sixes will be joining us in here. So when you see someone that looks wide-eyed and a little young, welcome them, make them feel at home. Uh, we wanna just make sure that they have a place to belong. Uh, that's it for me, uh, from me for now. I'm gonna be back up after Garth tells us what's happening next. So turn your attention to the screens. Hi everyone, and welcome to Grace Family Church. I'm Garth and I'm gonna fill you in on what's coming up at Grace and where you can get involved. If you haven't already started our How to Thrive Version plan, why not start today? If you don't have the Version app, download it on your phone, open the app and search for Grace Family Church. It's all free. The devotional plan is also called How to Thrive and is a helpful tool that will take you deeper into scripture and the topics we are speaking about on Sundays. Hi, moms and dads. Grace Kids is starting an adventure-filled series in primary called Clash of the Kingdoms and in pre-primary called Big Bible Battles. When we look at the battles in the Bible, God was always with His army and provided a way for them to win. God didn't let the army sit back while He did all the fighting. He sent His army out and He went with them. In life, we will have to fight big battles, whether it be emotional, physical, or family issues. But God does not let us fight them alone. He comes alongside us and provides a way for victory when we listen to Him and trust His way. Don't forget to grab a Faith at Home card from the Grace Kids Registration Desk so you can take these conversations home with you and be part of the adventure too. Our Day Missions team have a painting day mission planned for Saturday the 13th of October to William Clark Gardens Children's Home. The day will be spent painting walls and hanging curtains. Unfortunately, kids aren't invited on this day mission as the majority of the work entails climbing ladders. The team will leave from Grace Am Schlange at 8 a.m. and return at 1 p.m. Day missions are a brilliant way to serve our community. So get involved and email day missions at Grace. All this info will be on our website, app and social media pages. So make sure you're connected with us there. If you're looking for a group to be a part of, then go ahead and sign up on our website too. It's great to have you with us today. Enjoy the rest of the service. So just before I continue, I just want to just pause for a moment. One of the things that's important to us uh, here at the Mklanga PM service is community and, and a sense of doing life together. We don't just want to rush on by and, and sort of not engage in what's going on. And so we like to celebrate milestones. And a milestone that we actually haven't celebrated here is Ash and Craig. Ash and Craig, who is up here, can you guys stand quickly? And Ash and Craig, uh, Ash is pregnant with Craig's child. And I think that's awesome. 
for a number of reasons, because they married and a whole bunch of other stuff, but we really love you guys. Thank you so much for the incredible way we, uh, that you guys serve our church, and we're just praying uh, for you guys and celebrating with you, and so thank you so much for all that you do. We love you guys. Can we just give them a, a little round of applause? And, um, it's a boy, so buy blue things for them. If you just see them, just give them blue things. I think that would be awesome. So we're in this series uh, called How to Thrive, uh, how to not just survive, but how to thrive. And, and today we're speaking about how to thrive emotionally. And I don't know about you, but I don't think we could be speaking about a more appropriate topic than how to thrive emotionally considering yesterday's sporting results. That we would lose to New Zealand in the rugby in the last 20 minutes, in that way, I need to have some encouragement in my own heart. Or maybe you're not a rugby fan, maybe you're a Man United fan. And I just think that there's stuff going on in our world where we need to speak into how we thrive emotionally. Now, but the reason why we're doing this series uh, is because we think that, that there are a lot of spaces that so many of us are just surviving. Last week, we spoke about how to, how to thrive physically. That there is a way for us to be well when we're not well. And that God, the power of God, has, has this incredible ability to, to, to bring healing and restoration into our world. And if you weren't here last week, I really want to encourage you to jump online, go to our Grace app, and listen to what was said last week. Uh, next week, we're going to be speaking about how to thrive financially. And a little bit of a, a, a petrol price increase and a, a little bit of a vat here and there and, and all that's going on in the world around us. We did a, a, a weekly shop today, and I need to know how to thrive financially. And maybe you do too, because I think for a lot of us, we're just simply surviving. We're looking at our budget, we're looking at the margin that's present, and we're wondering how we can get through. And then finally, we're going to speak about how to thrive relationally. And maybe it's a relationship that you're dealing with at home, maybe it's a working relationship, but we believe in all of these categories, that God doesn't just simply want us to survive, God wants us to thrive. He wants us to thrive in these spaces, and today I want to speak into how God wants us to thrive emotionally. Now, I realize that as I've said the word emotion or emotionally, some of you are turning off right now, or some of you are nudging the person next to you and saying, hey, you need to listen to what's about to be said. In fact, as I was preparing the sermon, every now and again, I'd say, hey, Pips, this is my wife, and this is what I'm saying, and she says, and are you going to say that to yourself? And then I'd speak a little bit more, and then she says, that's also for you, Uh, and that there's some of you in here that when I say the word emotion, you're immediately starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. That's not something that you're comfortable dealing with, and I I acknowledge that space. That for some of you, you're not comfortable dealing with it because it's never been a part of your life, and emotions, what are those? Ask Sia. Sia has no emotions. That's our youth pastor. That's the kind of guy you want, let me just tell you. But for some of you, you get apprehensive around this stuff because of people in your lives, uh, because of things that you've seen, that this idea of emotions and thriving emotionally maybe doesn't necessarily meet you where you're at. But I just want to give us sort of a definition, because I really believe that this idea of thriving relationally, uh, sorry, thriving emotionally is something that we all need to engage in. And in order to lay sort of a foundation for why I think this is something that every single one of us, irrespective of how emotional we are, uh, every single one of us needs to engage in. And so I found this great sort of uh, um, phrase for, for what I think it means to thrive emotionally what I think emotional health looks like, and, and so I found this. Again, this isn't complete, but hopefully it lays a foundation for what we're speaking about. This is it. People who are emotionally healthy, that's people who are thriving emotionally, are in control of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They are able to cope with some of life's challenges. Emotionally healthy people still stress, feel anger, uh, and sadness, but they know how to manage these negative emotions. Now, there's a few distinctions that I just want to make up front, and it's important to note that that what what we're not saying here is that when we're speaking about how to thrive emotionally, that emotions are bad, or that bad emotions are bad. And I'm going to speak into this a little bit later. We're not saying that if you're sitting here and, and your journey has been around mental health, that, well, this isn't for you. What we're saying is that when it comes to thriving emotionally, it's how you and I engage with our full range of emotions. Now, just to let you know, some of you have that. I need to tell myself, every now and again, I can feel sad. It's okay. It's a part of the journey, right? But, but for all of us, this is something that's important. And I think there's two reasons. There's two reasons that I want to speak into that, that I think it's important that, that all of us take a step towards thriving emotionally. There's two reasons why I think that this is something for every single one of us. And the first reason is this, 
is that when we're thriving emotionally and when we have emotional health, it bridges the gap between what we profess and what we present. When we're thriving emotionally, when, we're, when we have emotional health, it helps us bridge the gap between what we profess, so I'm a Christian, I'm trying to follow this, this God thing, I'm on that journey, and what we present, how we live, and, and how we show our faith to the world around us. You see, as, as Christians, as Christ followers, if you're in this room and, and, that, and you'd consider yourself that, uh, the journey is somewhat easy to some extent, although it's incredibly also difficult. But, it, but the premise is easy. Love God, love people, and make a difference. Love God, love people, and make a difference in the world around us. Jesus says, what's the greatest commandment? Love me with all your heart. I love people. And then the Great Commission, make a difference in the world around you. For me, the, the loving God bit is, although not always easy because I can't always see God, or I don't see God rather, I can't always see God, I don't see God, um, just so you can trust me a little bit, yeah? Uh, but but it's, it's somewhat tangible. There's things that I can do. I can come to church, I can sing, I can raise my hands to look really Christian, I can read my Bible, I can go on the YouVersion app and read the Grace Reading Plan just to let you know. I'll punt that a few times. Uh, you know, there's things that I can do that help me love God. The making a difference side of this is also somewhat easy. Like, I, I think it's tangible. I know that I can do a, a mission trip or speak to someone about Jesus, and, and these things are somewhat tangible. But we're also called to love people. We're also called to love people, and that means showing kindness, being patient, showing love, expressing generosity. But I don't know about you, People don't always make it easy for me to love them. Like this morning, we're at 10 to 4. My, neighbor, my neighbor's son decided to arrive home. I think the right way, is un, uh, right way of saying this is unstable. Like he arrived home not being able to walk stably. I don't know how to get into that. But he arrived home at 10 to 4 this morning. And he decided that at 10 to 4 this morning, I just need you to understand the kind of language I'm using here. He decided to not pr press the gate, uh, the gate buzzer off his mom's flat, but to rather press our gate buzzer at 10 to 4 this morning. I just need to say that one more time. He pressed our gate buzzer when we were sleeping at 10 to 4 this morning. And I turned almost immediately to my phone. I got WhatsApp open and I'd already written an entire essay to his mom, scolding her and him for their behavior. Didn't she know that we had a child who wasn't sleeping and, and Pips, my wife, lovingly encouraged me to put my phone down and to create a bit of a space between my response. But so often we have these spaces where we know that we should be patient, we know that we should be gracious, we know that we should be kind, and at 10 to 4 in the morning, I have a gap. That there are these spaces, and, and I think emotional health, emotional health allow, allows us to bridge the gap between what we profess and what we present. When we are growing in emotional maturity, it helps us bridge this gap. Emotional maturity is the ability to identify and manage our own emotions as well as the emotions of other people. And I love the way Peter, Sch Peter Schizero says this in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I'd really encourage you to read it. It's a phenomenal book, but he says this. He says, it is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. All of us need to go on this journey of thriving emotionally. Proverbs 4 says this, guard your heart above all else. Your heart is not just this thing that beats inside of you. The, the writer is trying to express a sense of mind and soul and emotion and thoughts. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. I think emotional health is important for all of us, and, and I think this idea of thriving emotionally is something that we can all engage in. The second reason why I think it matters is this, the simple and, and beautiful reality that we are transformed, you and I, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. We know that we have been made in the image of God. If you didn't know that, I wanna just let you know. You have been made in the image of God. You are an image bearer of the creator of the universe. All of you, every aspect of you, your mind, your soul, your body, and your emotions, every element of you, you have been made in the image of God. But we also know that part of the journey of this world is that, that we have been marred by the fall. We have been marred by our separation from God because of our own stuff, the stuff that we've done and the stuff that we haven't. And that means that, that all of us, to some extent, is marred. 
our, our, our physicality, our, our emotions, these things are marred. But the beautiful reality is this, that because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, the, the, the astounding grace that he displays towards us says, it's not about what you do, it's about what Jesus has done that allows every single one of us to be remade into the image of God. That we have been made in the image of God, that we have been marred by our separation, but beautifully, beautifully, we are being remade into the image of God, all of us, every element of who we are. And that's why when I read Romans 12, I'm, I'm so encouraged by this idea. It says this, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you, become remade, transformed, you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Our emotions, to say this, our emotions play a big part in how we're transformed through the renewing of our minds. There's so many other passages that speak, speak into this, that, that the work that God is doing in us as he transforms us, that, that his spirit is doing within us as he renews us and, and, and changes the way that we think and behave, it's a, it's, a, it's a dealing with our emotions to some extent. For the fruits of the spirit are love and joy and peace and patience. Those all have emotional connections. And so therefore, our emotional thriving is an important part of how we, of how we grow spiritually. I just want to, as I continue this journey, I just want to pause for a moment. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that for some of you in here, that, that, that already what I'm speaking about is maybe for some ex, to some extent a disconnect. And I want to acknowledge that for some of you in this room, and for some of you who are watching online, when it comes to, to this topic, the thing that you're dealing with most is, is around mental health and, and mental health issues. That just statistically, there are going to be people in this room who are dealing with different levels of anxiety and depression and other mental health related issues. Maybe you're not, maybe someone you know is. And, and I don't think that the church at large, and I hope that we do this well, but we don't always, I don't think that we always acknowledge this space well. I don't think Christianity has done a good job in our history around mental health. I think so often that, that we've just passed it with saying, well, we'll pray for you and you'll get better. You shouldn't feel that way. If we're honest, sometimes our services don't necessarily meet those needs. We don't sing songs of lament and despair and worry and heartbreak. We don't sing those songs. We try and sing uplifting songs. And sometimes the challenge with that is that that doesn't meet you where you're at. Because you're on a real journey of restoration and finding freedom and hope. And, and I just want to acknowledge that, that if you are on that journey, can I encourage you to con continue to seek help from the right places? If you are dealing with some level of, of emotional uh, uh, health, sorry, mental health issues, whether it's depression or anxiety or any other related mental health uh, um, space, please find help in the right places. We have a phenomenal counseling ministry here at our church. Contact them. See, see what next steps you can take. Find help in the right places. Um, I just want to encourage you, if you are in that space, for, for far too long, I think that people in these spaces have felt guilty and have felt shame. Because they shouldn't be feeling, you shouldn't be feeling the way you're feeling because you're a Christian. You're a person of faith. You shouldn't be feeling that way. But we know that God is taking you on a journey of restoration. We know that God is working alongside those in your world to bring about health and wholeness into your space. And if it's okay with you, I, I, I'd just like to pray for you. If you are in this room and that's been your journey, I'd just love to pray for you for a moment. And so can we just bow in the space and just, under, just sort of uh, with a sense of, yeah, that God is here. Jesus, in, in the midst of the complexity of all that this is, we just acknowledge that you are present in the midst of all that we deal with. And so, Father, for those in this room right now that, that, are, that are engaging with any level of mental health challenge, that you would just remind them of your presence, that you would remind them that you are with them, God, and that you would just help uh, Give them the strength and the courage to find help in the right places and, and bring about restoration and healing and wholeness in them, God. We, we thank you that, that, that every single one of these people are on a journey, on a journey of restoration. And we commit them to you now, God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for just pausing with me in that, in that space. And if that is you again, I, I just want to encourage you to seek help uh, in the right spaces and, and to continue to go on that journey. But part of the reason why I acknowledge that is because this talk doesn't just, I don't just want to speak into uh, that side of thriving emotionally. 
I hope that what I speak into in the next little while uh, gives those of you who are in that space a, a tool and some resources to journey with you. But like I said, this idea of thriving emotionally is something that we can all journey on. It's an important part of how we bridge the gap between what we profess and what we present. It's an important part of how, of how we are transformed uh, by the renewing of our minds. And so, so how do we do that? How can every single one of us, how can we take steps to, to thrive emotionally, to find emotional health? And, and I just want to give you three simple ideas and thoughts. They may meet you where you're at. They may be tools that you take and, and put in place later. If you have a note-taking device, uh, sometimes that's a pen and paper. I know that's like a wild thought. For some of you, it's your phones. Maybe you just want to jot down these three ideas. How can we, th- how can we find emotional health? How can, we, how can we thrive emotionally? The first thing that I want to encourage us is this. Be mindful in moments. Be mindful in moments. One of the incredible tools uh, that is given to us through the wholeness course is a tool that helps us understand that, that, that when we face something that provokes an, uh, an emotional response in us, there is a way to, to respond better to that situation. And the way that we do that is by, by creating a gap between what we experience that creates emotion and the moment that we respond. You see, we know that, that through neuroscience, there, there are pathways that are created in our minds uh, that, that lead us to respond in particular ways. So when someone says something to you or when you see something, what happens is that neurologically, there's a pathway that leads you to respond in a particular way. So when your wife says a little comment about a certain particular thing, not that this happened yesterday, um, and, and I start to well up with sort of an emotional response, sometimes it's frustration, sometimes it's impatience, whatever the case is, the reason why I so quickly go to that space is because there's a pathway that's been created because of what I've experienced in the past and how I've responded in the past. For some of you, you've experienced this. You're dealing with someone in your work environment, and because of the way that they're behaving or because of the things that they're saying, your emotions just get ramped up real quick around them. Maybe it's someone in your home. Maybe it's someone in your world. And the way that we create a better response, the way that we are, we are able to thrive emotionally in these spaces is by creating a gap from when the first situation happens to the moment we respond. And one of the tools that's given in the wholeness course is the simple thing of just counting to six. So when someone does something to you and you feel your emotions starting to ramp up and the taxi driver gently slides in front of you and you want to wave to them with the other side of your hand, just pause. Count to six. Think of six names. Think of six fruits. I can never get to more than three fruits. That's my life, right? But just get get to the number six. Get to six countries, whatever the case may be. But create a moment of pause. Be present in that moment. Be mindful in that moment of the emotions that are being created. And then beautifully, we can remind them of some truths. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that because I'd really encourage you to do the wholeness course. So if you're not in a group here at Grace, if you aren't in a group, can I encourage you to find a group that's doing the wholeness course and to be a part of that journey? You can chat to Dylan. This is Dylan here. You can go to the Group Life um, info desk and, and, and find a place to belong because it's an incredible thing. The wholeness course is also starting tomorrow night at the Riverside campus. And so if you aren't in a group and being in a group freaks you out, I'd encourage you to go through to to the Riverside campus and to do the wholeness course there. Because there's an incredible tool uh, to help us be mindful in moments. But there's another element of this for me. There's another element of this this being mindful in moments. And so uh, just to illustrate this, I wanna just share a little bit of my journey around uh, this element. And, and a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, probably about two months ago, uh, we'd just been away on some leave. So we'd been uh, in the Midlands to rest and to recuperate. And we'd come back on Thursday for sort of a, a weekend in Durban and we were gonna enjoy that. And on Thursday nights or Friday morning at about three o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, um, my wife got out of bed. Now, this isn't an unusual thing because my wife is a sleep talker and a sleep walker. It's incredibly exhilarating. I've got videos on here that would really make you laugh, and I'm not going to show them to you now because she's sitting there and getting, uh, would get embarrassed. Uh, just to highlight one of my best stories is in the first few months of our marriage, um, uh, first few months, first few weeks of our marriage, I woke up one morning and all my shoes were lined up at the door with my bag. 
I'm still processing that. I don't know what she was trying to get at in that moment, but that's, that's a genuine true story, um, and that's awesome. If you want to um, interpret that for me, you're welcome to do so. I think I should have got the lesson, uh, got the message a while ago. Anyway, so, so when she gets up, I don't sort of like make much of it. I sort of just say, hey, don't forget the alarm's on, and she mumbles something back to me. Uh, but this time she walked through to, uh, through sort of our passageway, and we've got a little curtain that separates the bedrooms from the lounge and, and the kitchen, and she called back to me, and she said, there's someone trying to get into the house. And genuinely, I thought that she was sleep talking, and so, but I thought, you know, the, the, the appropriate and responsible husbandry thing to do would be to go and look. And so I walked through and looked through the curtain, and uh, there were two uh, gentlemen uh, who decided that they wanted to have coffee. I think um, in our house, I think the right term for them is un- unwelcome guests. I think that's probably the best way to say it. Um, and they were, taking the, they were about to take the window frame off and, and come inside and make themselves at home. And, uh, and we saw them, we you know, pressed the panic button, and, and they went, and, and we were safe, thankfully. Uh, but if I'm honest with you, I haven't been able to really shake that too much over the last while. That I've been, like, particularly in the first few weeks, I'd wake up sort of every single time at like 3.30 with incredible anxiety and fear within my heart. And, and, and I was battling to understand why. You know, we'd been, we'd been the recipients of crime before. We, we've had a car stolen from my house. Guys put like a pool pole through and, and they left. And so maybe it was because I'd seen their faces. And, and I didn't really feel like that was the case because, you know, I, I've been a victim of crime in other ways where that's happened. And I thought, you know, was it, was it something about the, the, the fear of, of, of what happened to my dad? My, my dad, some of you know this, was uh, killed many years ago in our home in Johannesburg. And so was I uh, fearful of that? But I, I felt like I dealt with that to some extent. And yet, and yet I couldn't get away from this feeling of anxiety and this feeling of fear. And to be honest with you, I'm not through it yet. I'm still on this journey. But, but here's what I know, that we need to be mindful in moments, that I have been challenged and encouraged to be mindful in the moment, to stop to pause, to reflect, to think, to speak to people that I trust, people that I know, people that can speak into my life. Because I think far too often in our world, in our busy and rushed world, where emotions aren't popular things to deal with, that that for far too many of us, we rush past moments that really matter. We, We rush past emotions, things that are happening around us and things that are happening inside of us that really matter. And my encouragement, my encouragement to myself and my encouragement to you is to to be mindful in the moments because this is what I know, that when we're mindful in these moments, when we're conscious of what's happening, when we reflect, when we pause, we will find hope, we will find restoration, we will find freedom and we will find a sense of healing when we're mindful in these moments. We need to be mindful of these spaces and and not rush past moments that matter. For some of you, this is an encouragement to stop and to think and to speak to someone because of what's going on in here. For for some of you, this is an encouragement to stop and pause and reflect on the good things that are happening in your life. Both of these, both the good and the challenge, we need to be mindful of these moments because it's one of the ways that we're able to to thrive emotionally. It's one of the ways that we're able to, to, to thrive emotionally and grow spiritually. God meets us in these spaces. Can I encourage you to be mindful in moments. The second encouragement that I have for us, and, and again, I'm not saying this lightly, especially because of what I spoke about earlier around mental health. I don't think that if you're dealing with these things, the answer is just to simply pray about it. But here's what I do know, and I hope this encourages you wherever you are. I want to encourage you to find power in prayer. I want to encourage you to find power in prayer. Prayer, prayer is an incredibly powerful tool that helps us in our emotional uh, health journey. Uh, the, the beautiful thing here is that, that mindfulness, mindfulness, the ability to, to process what we're going through, what's happening around us and in us, mindfulness, like our physical strength, requires endurance. Mindfulness requires endurance. So a, a while ago, um, some of the guys in my uh, small group, uh, we decided that uh, we'd want to play squash because, I don't know, that's just what we decided to do. One of the guys lives at a place that has a squash court. Now, I haven't played squash for, for many, many years. If you don't know what it is, it's a stupid sport. You're stuck in a little room with a little ball that hurts you if you get hit, and you chase it around for a while. Uh, but one of the things is that, that it requires like some, I'm not going to do that on, too much on stage, but, but it requires like some real like 
um, movement. And I haven't done those movements for, for quite a while. And so we played squash. And if I'm honest, I got beaten really badly by Julian, who has only gray hair. And so that hurt me on the inside. And then that Sunday night, we came to church and I was hosting. And I genuinely battled to walk up these stairs. Like you're meant to walk up onto stage with like energy. And I was like, oh, Shivers, that's unbelievable. But slowly but surely, as we started to play some more, as we started to build up some endurance for this thing, I began to enjoy the, the sports. I began to enjoy it. When I didn't have the endurance, I hated every moment. I'm not saying I enjoy every moment now, but the beautiful thing is that when we engage in acts of endurance, we start to enjoy what's going on around us. If you're a runner, you know this to be true. I don't know why you would run, but if you do run, that's cool. Like when you start running, you don't enjoy it really. You don't take in what's going on around you. But as you gain in strength and endurance, you start to appreciate what's happening in the world around you. And scientists have proven, this is so beautiful, scientists have proven through study that one of the best ways, if not the best way, to improve our emotional endurance is through prayer. I love, I love that so often science is catching up to what God has always had in store for us. Uh, Just to demonstrate uh, demonstrate this to you, there were two tests that were done. The first test was the emotional suppression test, which sounds fun, I suppose. Um, But what they did is they made people watch a really funny video, and they told them not to laugh. And then uh, then they, they sort of timed them. And then they sent them away. And they told them to do a whole bunch of different things. And and they told one group uh, in that study to go and pray, uh, to go away and to pray. And when they they came back, it was the people who prayed that had a a greater control of their emotional response. The second test that they did was uh, was called the Stroop Task Test. I don't know, that's a weird name, but this is what it looked like. So so they showed the contestants or the the study people things, uh, this image. Uh, So this is the image. And so what we're going to do in this room is you're going to read the word, not the color. Okay, so we're going to do this together. And that means you have to speak. um, And I know that's for some of you a bit of a step, but but can we do that? Can we do that? Okay, so we're going to say the word, not the color. So let's go. Red, green, blue, yellow, pink, orange, blue, green, some of you are not getting that, and that's okay, like you're seeing the wrong, no, I'm joking. So what they did is they, they timed people, and they timed how long it took them to do that, and then they showed them the next image. Now, don't read this aloud. Uh, so the next image, the, the, uh, the other one, there we go. Now we're going to read the colors again. We're reading the words, not the color. Now, don't read this aloud, and they did it. So the first time they showed them the words where where the word was the same as the color, and the second time they showed them where the word was different to the color that was over the word, and they timed them. And again, they told that same set of people to go away and do a whole bunch of different things, but to one set of people, they said pray. And it was the people who prayed that had a greater ability to decrease the time between the first reading and the second reading. Now, I could give you a whole bunch of scriptures around why it's important to pray, but I just love that science is telling us if we want to increase in our emotional endurance, one of the ways we can do that is through prayer, through praying daily, through praying in moments that matter, through through being mindful of what God is doing in and around us and, and through speaking to him. But the other element of this for me is also so encouraging. The other element of this for me is that is similar to what I spoke about earlier. That for for many of you, when it comes to emotional health, you feel guilty because of the things that you feel. And and for some of you, you don't feel like you can express that to God. And my encouragement to you is to find power in prayer by expressing what's going on in here and up here to God. He's not afraid. I love this psalm just to demonstrate to you that God's not afraid of our prayers. I love this psalm, Psalm 38. It says this, my guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sin. These are encouraging words, aren't they? I am bent over and wracked uh, with pain. All day long, I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my heart and my health is broken. I am exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. Some of you, that's been your week. For some of you, that's been the last few months. For some of you, that's been your life. My encouragement to you is to not hold back from what's going on in here and up, uh, in, your, in your minds, to, to express what's happening to God in the full extent of what you feel, and God will meet you in those moments, and there is power in prayer. So let us be mindful of moments, and let's find power in prayer. And the last thought I have is this, is that there is security in identity. There is security for us in identity. I love the song 
uh, that we sang earlier, and it was written by a guy called Horatio, the song It Is Well. He'd lost his oldest son uh, to, to a disease. He'd lost his entire business in the Chicago fires. He lost three daughters uh, in a shipwreck. And then he pens this, these words. And he says, it's well. And as Felicia spoke about so, so beautifully earlier, we don't say it is well with our souls because of what's going on in the world around us. We can say boldly that it is well with our souls, not because of the position of our lives, but because of the posture of our hearts. A posture that says, God, you are above all, you are faithful, you are good, you are, you are over everything, you are in everything, in everything, everything holds together in who you are, Jesus. And because of this absolute security of who God is, we can stand and rest secure and say, God, it is well with my soul, not because of what's going on in the world around me, but because of who you are, it is well. I look at Job, uh, the story of Job, Job, uh, the, the book of Job, I'd encourage you to read it, but Job loses everything, and he cries out to God, and God's response to him is so interesting. God doesn't respond with, Job, I'm sorry that all of this has happened to you. Job, I, I feel compassion towards you. God's response to Job in this moment is, Job, where were you when I created the world? Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Job, where were you when I, when I stretched out the earth's surveying lines and laid its cornerstones? Tell me if you know such thing. Job, where were you when I called the stars into existence and spanned the sky with clouds? Job, tell me where you were when I, when I called the thunder into being and made it roar into the world. Job, where were you? I find that response so interesting because, because in some extent, it's not a compassionate response. But actually, in every way, it is. Because what God is telling Job in that moment is, Job, don't find security in, in what's going on in the world around you. Find absolute security and foundation in who I am. And my encouragement to you is to go on that journey, to find security in the identity of God because it is unchanging and in every way he is faithful to you. And you can find strength in that place. But the beautiful thing is God doesn't stop there because not only does he have absolute security in who he is, the God of the entire universe then turns and says to you, this is who you are. We can live, and I, and I almost get a sense that, that we must live from a place of understanding who God is, but who God says we are. Because when we begin to understand who God is and who God says we are, then when we face challenges that bring up emotional responses, we're able to say, no, this is who I am. You're saying this about me, world. You're saying this about me, friends. You're saying this about me, work situation. But I know who I am because of who Jesus says I am. And for some of you, I wanna encourage you with these words, 1 John 3. It says, see how very much our Father loves us. See how very much he loves you. For he calls us, he calls you his children. And this is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize what we are, that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we, uh, what we will be like when Christ appears. But, but we do know we will be like him. That is who you are. You are an image bearer of the creator of the universe. The very DNA of Christ lives in you. This is who you are, for we will see him as he really is. And, and part of how we find that, that, that security in our identity and who God is and who God, says we is, who God says we are is through this. God has got promises over your life. God has got incredible encouragement for who he is and who he says you are that's found here. And, and as God mentioned earlier, I do wanna encourage you to get out your phones uh, after the service. Don't get them out now because you'll start Instagramming and I don't know, what, you know you'll, you'll get distracted. Uh, but but to, to go on to you version to type in Grace Family Church Thrive or How to Thrive or Grace Family Church and, and to join us and do this, this, this daily devotion. This week, for the seven days of this week, uh, Mads Dazel, the head of our counseling ministry, has written uh, the devotions on how to thrive emotionally. I really wanna encourage you because I, when we engage in what God says about us, we start to find security in our identity. But if you don't have a phone uh, that has you version or that freaks you out, this is a really cool thing. You can buy these in stores and they don't run out of battery or any of those things. And so maybe for some of you, the journey over the next while is going to be to, to read your devotions or continue to read or maybe to start to read and just to simply ask the question, God, who are you and who do you say I am? Because I believe that we're, we're, we'll, be, we'll have the ability to thrive emotionally when we find security in our identity. Can we pause for a moment and just finish the service in some prayer and reflection? 
just want to ask just three questions that, that are related to this. The first one is this. What moments, what moments do you need to be mindful of? What moments do you need to be mindful of? What's gone on in your world over the last while? What's going on in your heart right now? What's going on in the weeks ahead? What moments do you need to be mindful of? To reflect, to pause, to think, to allow God to meet you in those spaces. In what situations do you need to find power in prayer? What what, what situation that you're going to face this week that you know is going to stir up an emotional response in you? Where there's going to be a gap, where can you pray and say, God, give me the strength to face that situation? What are you facing out ahead of you that's bringing fear and anxiety, and how can you find power in prayer? And my last encouragement to you is how? How are you going to go on the journey of finding security in your identity? Join us on the YouVersion reading plan, but find ways to understand who God is and then who God says you are. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are the source of all that we have and all that we are. And so I just pray for all of us that that as we go on this journey of of thriving emotionally, of, of finding emotional health, of bridging the gap between what we profess and what we present, of, of, of being transformed by the renewing of our minds, God. And our emotions play such a big part in that. Help us, help all of us, God, to be mindful in moments. Help all of us, God, to find power in prayer. And just uh, constantly remind us of who you are, Jesus, and then who you say we are. And thank you that there is security in that. And so we commit ourselves to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, There will be some prayer volunteers up front. I'd encourage you to hang out after the service, grab some coffee up here, maybe grab some chow. Have an amazing week and join us next week.